I am Greg Mills, the director of the Brentos Foundation, which is based in Johannesburg. I've spent much of the last 20 years traveling the length and breadth of Africa and much of the developing world beyond in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and also in the Middle East. It's striking how colonial history, demographics, and in some cases, mineral endowments are not a good predictor of a country's success or failure. There are many examples of desperately poor countries that have found a way to lift their people out of poverty. And there are countries which are rich in oil and gold and in other endowments, which have got poorer and poorer, including some in Africa. This raises two questions. What makes one country succeed and another fail? Why do some countries reform and keep reforming while others seem permanently stuck in a cycle of impoverishment? It is clear that our business as usual approach to economic development simply doesn't work. In Africa, where the population will double over the next 25 years, we need a new approach. It needs to break the poverty cycle and identify and implement the reforms that will lead to economic success for more than just the elites. This book, Rich State, Poor State, is my journey to find out what those reforms are and importantly, how to go beyond posturing to make them stick. This is not an academic game. There is a dynamic generation of young Africans whose future will be decided by these decisions. Compared to their peers on other continents, Africans are half as wealthy today as they were at independence. Why has this happened? How have generations of Africans fallen further behind as the world has moved ahead? The answer is as tragic as it is simple. Africa has been failed by its dysfunctional politics. Instead of throwing out the old colonial order, many African countries have imitated it, creating a new elite which has feasted on its rich resources at the expense of most of the people. A devastating new political system has been built where a clientelist political economy only addresses short-term popular needs to keep the elite in power. The longer-term reforms needed to build larger, more inclusive economies never happen because this threatens to loosen the elite's hold over the economy. Elites continue to follow this path since they can get away with it, most of the time at least, by employing combinations of identity politics and populism and using external support to barricade their power. They get away with it because they are allowed to by people trapped in a system of government that deliberately emasculates and undermines the impact of their vote. A growing number don't even bother with the vote and prefer direct military rule through coup d'etats. Politics is not about placing the people first. It is about doing what the elite needs to do to keep its enrichment machine going. Bureaucracies become less a check and balance on executive power than a roadblock to getting things done, at risk of operating in narrow personal and vested interests, subject to incompetencies and job insecurities. This helps to explain why the cost of Africa's lost economic ground is so vast, and the upside of getting things right, or at least better, encouragingly positive. The answer appears to lie not in the technocratic details of reform, since these are comparatively easy to identify, but rather in the choices that the leaders and their political networks make. There is no fixed reason why countries should not reform and recover, even though circumstances from climate to geography can make this more difficult. More important is the manner in which governments seek to make changes, their ability to plan, prioritize, and implement ultimately the way in which leaders back their people. Good leaders armed with strategic nerve and moral integrity can make a difference. While some countries from the Baltics to Mauritius, Singapore, Vietnam, and Botswana have refused to be dragged down by their history, 
Others had become prisoners of their past. Around the same time that Poland and the Baltic states of Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia threw off the yoke of fascist Soviet rule, South Africa underwent its own negotiated transition to freedom, from apartheid to democracy. But whereas Poland and the Baltics moved quickly from a state-centric to a liberal system, South Africa headed in the opposite direction, replacing one racial oligarchy with another, with the state at the center as the means of redistribution. At the top of the income totem, this made a few politically connected entrepreneurs exceedingly rich. Further down, redistribution was effected through civil service jobs, at the bottom, through welfare payments. But this approach will never be enough in at least two respects. The first, in terms of the money that could be redistributed to meet expectations. And the second, in terms of the corrosive effect on the state itself. The result was the state capture period suffered under President Jacob Zuma, who took office in 2009, which removed or simply ignored governance structures in handing out contracts, a process that cost the country an estimated 25% of its annual budget. Institutional erosion and then failure led to loss of confidence in and respect for the state, compounding the effect. The longer-term outcomes can be seen in a collapse of basic service delivery, the poor performance of municipalities, the problems experienced in electricity and water delivery, low levels of growth and investment and corresponding increase in unemployment, and more starkly, a radical increase in crime, especially violent crime. Four times more South African citizens were killed in violent crime in 2022 than civilians who died in the war in Ukraine. While some might prefer the idea of a big man to get things done, there are dangers in the temptation of authoritarianism or of new wave populism. Hope exists in a range of examples which have turned around apparently hopeless situations, far more dire than those faced by South Africans. Politics requires leaders to make the difficult choices, but the temptation of inertia, keeping things the way they are to make their elites happy, often overwhelms good intentions. Yet change is possible, perhaps inevitable, and can have a tremendously positive effect. Witness the impact of liberalization in the telecom sector. But when state operating systems are built on elite rent-seeking, changing them is hard and requires tough-minded leadership with a plan and a mandate to carry out reforms. There is hope for Africa, but it requires a willingness to make the tough choices and returning the people to the center of policy choices and service delivery. This book is about how the right leadership with the right policies can make it happen. Another mind.